Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Vincent's uh, webinar series, uh, Being the Case Collective. Uh, today's series is aged care and the latter state phases of retirement. Um, today, um, my name is Mark Alara, and I'm joined by Kerry Darton. My role is the uh, Director of Financial Advisor at Vincent's, and Kerry is our um, uh, aged care professional, our specialist in this space. Uh, firstly, just a quick uh, message, as a disclaimer, being general advice only and does not take into consideration personal circumstances. If you'd like to discuss that, please um, don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, so what's on offer today? Um, what we're going to do is just look at the, the three phases of retirement, um, just briefly. Our real focus is going to be on the aged care, but just how does that fit into retirement planning, the later stages of retirement planning. Um, Kerry will run through that and then we'll go through, uh, or Kerry will run through three quick case studies just to give a, a better feel for what that looks like. Okay, so the three phases of retirement. So with, with uh, traditional financial planning, um, what we often see is, is a, a retirement income stream looked at on how that matches up with their cost of living. So we often see just an indexed income in a straight line um, between now and, their, and to the end of their life expectancy. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't allow for higher care needs for later in life. So in reality, um, you'll see the, the, um, the picture on the right. What it looks for is those three phases is what we'd like to discuss with clients. The first two phases, um, probably familiar with. The first phase, definitely familiar with. That's the uh, great, I've, I'm carefree, I've left work um, and, you know, we're still active and physically out there, you know, travelling and doing those sort of things. That's the largest phase. The next phase is where we start to wind down, down a bit. So not travelling as much. What that tends to do is tend to back off the level of spending. But as we get to the end of that second phase, our health can start to deteriorate, which leads into the third phase, and that's a trial to years. So what ha what we expect there is that the spending pattern starts to tick back up again, similar to you know your first carefree years. So hence the um, you know more, looking more like a smile as opposed to a straight line. When we look at the retirement planning, we we would we say there's three three phases, or in this case, we've got three pillars. One is longevity. So what that means is how long will a capital last? So will it last the life expectancy of the retiree? The second one is sequencing risk, and that's more around the investment process and you know the impact of um, negative investment returns in the early part of the investment time frame, and the impact that can have on long term returns and how to manage that. The second part is about frailty risk. And this is a part that we, you know, is often ignored. And it's more about just a straight line cost of living. The impact of this though, is that a lump sum can have a material impact on longevity risk um, and the ability to maintain their lifestyle of a surviving spouse. So the things that we'd like you to consider or, you know, we encourage to consider is as part of that retirement strategy, how you'd expect to fund aged care costs. Understand the role the home can play in that. The impact of relying on family and friends for support. And then ensure that you ask the question, are you willing? And hopefully you're not willing to ignore frailty risk. And therefore it allows us to work with clients and advisors alike to strategize and put an appropriate plan in place. Um, so that's the end of, that's really the impact on where this aged care fits in retirement strategies and, and retirement planning. So with that, I'll hand over to Kerry to talk more about um, the services and the process engaged in aged care. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so today I'm just going to quickly run through um, the next few slides. It's more about giving you, oh, sorry, I nearly fell off my chair. That's not good. Um, it's more about just giving you a background on what we're talking about and why we're talking about this and to just set the scene. Then we're going to run through some th three case studies, which is really the meat of what we want to talk to you about today. So with um, options, 
when someone says aged care, people often just think of um, going into a retirement village, nursing home. And however, this when we talk aged care, um, we're talking about a broader um, environment. We're talking about um, care in the home. So if you have a look at this particular this particular slide, the first three, granny flat, and people often think of a granny flat as a standalone structure. It's actually a right to live in a, in somewhere. So it's paying for the right to reside there for the rest of your life. Um, residential care is the permanent care arrangement, which is often for the last two to three years of someone's life when they need 24 seven care. And then in-home care, everyone wants to stay in their home. So we help people understand how to access and how to utilize their um, resources so that they can actually stay in the home for longer. The last two on that slide is retirement village and lifestyle village. And that's more um, when we're looking at people who want to, um, have more care, but it's more of a lifestyle decision. So you're moving into a retirement village when you're still quite active and you just wanna be part of a community, but you want to have a little bit more of that, um, that you want, you don't wanna be doing your lawns and maintaining your house and things. So the last two are um, state legislation as well. So they've got very different rules and costings and things around them. The first three are Commonwealth, legislation and we can talk you through what the different options are, what the impact are, is on fees and how you fund all of those particular types of care. They also are not mutually exclusive. So sometimes we are talking to people about how to stay in their home and access in home care, but then we also have the forward thinking of how we're going to ensure that estate intentions aren't compromised, that you aren't unwinding a financial strategy that you've got in place to generate income um, and yet you'll still have funds available to access your residential care. So how can we help? The type of questions that we get are often personal preferences and what, what does all this mean? So a lot of the people that come and see us, they are often overwhelmed. It's um, They don't really want to talk about aged care there's often been a medical crisis, although we are very big on pre-planning is important and don't wait for a crisis to actually understand what your options are because you will find that it will, if you haven't put some planning into this process, you can unravel um, all of your good work that you've done with your estate intentions and your financial plans. So the types of questions people, um, there's a lot of terms, so we can talk you through how to navigate the system and what the system means, whether you qualify for low means, whether you're standard care, how to access home care. Um, we also, it's not a straight through process. So sometimes we will suggest that you do something like retain your home for two years, because from a Centrelink perspective, there's benefits in retaining the home for two years. But what's the next step? Once that two year window has um, lapsed, how do we move on to the next step of funding your uh, funding care needs? So who can we help? We predominantly um, find that we're helping accountants, financial advisors and lawyers. Um, and it's usually a client comes in and they have a crisis that's going on um, and they've got a need. But what we're trying to encourage is the conversation about aged care and the importance that if when you're talking to clients or when you're thinking about your parents, think about, am I going to have to, do I think I'm gonna to have to be helping my parents? Um, is, are they in a financial position that they will be able to help themselves? So what we um, often do is we work with other professionals um, that are trusted advisors of clients, um, but we also work with our existing client base and help their parents and help um, them understand how, either how to access care for their partner or access care for their parents. We also are often helping grandchildren who have, a, um, who's helping their grandmother or grandfather move into care. So our value lies in the advice we give. We help our clients and your clients or your, your family um, to avoid risks and costly mistakes. We also help people take small steps and big breaths. So that if this is an overwhelming um, situation often that people haven't talked about, they don't wanna talk about going into aged care. 
Um, there's very few people who put up their hand and go, pick me, I want to go into aged care. It's normally a health-related decision or something happens to either themselves or their informal carers and they're forced into a position where they need to reassess how they're currently living their life and how they can access help. I think that's a big one there, Kerry, if I might just ask you. I mean, cutting through that is actually, it's often a very stressful situation and time. So being able to provide that clear direction gives them a sense of comfort. It assists their relationships and de-stresses the whole yeah. process. Yeah. So it's about taking that step back and not jumping into con jumping to conclusions because you're in a stressful situation, but understanding what your options are and then making a cut, like a... Methodically yeah. working through it. Yeah. So... That's sort of a bit of the background. If anyone has any other, like if you want to know some more about the um, aged care system and stuff, we're always here to talk through. We love talking aged care. <laughs> well, I love talking aged care. So the first case study I'm going to run through with you today is I had a brother and sister who came in to talk about their mum's situation. The plan was to place their mum into a care facility. Uh, they um, based on their discussion, they were adamant that they'd found a facility that they wanted to put their mum in and they knew the residential aged care home that they wanted. So their mother was at home and she wanted to stay at home. She wasn't part of this discussion, um, but her dementia was progress had During COVID, her um, dementia had accelerated and and she, could, she was exhibiting at-risk behaviours staying in the home. So we were looking at how do we take better care of her. So our approach is usually um, someone comes in and I listen to their story. So I listen to the journey that they've been on. Um, they've been trying to care for their mother and her needs were increasing. Well, I then step you through what the um, system is and what the different terms are and how they all interact and, um, you know, discuss the basically navigating the monster that's called the aged care system. I think on that there too, your role in, because it's often the siblings, you know, a brother and a sister in this case, dealing with the parent, uh, you do provide that independence and yeah. that clarity of thought around yeah. that because you're not emotionally attached to the decision as a sibling often is. Yeah, and often um, even um, when there's siblings that are in the room, sometimes we're dealing with an enduring power of attorney and they, there's a lot of guilt in the aged care system and in the aged care decisions. So often we will have like an enduring power of attorney and what they're worried about is, am I doing the right thing by my parents? What are my siblings going to think? Like they're worried that, that what they're doing is going to be misread. So by actually having a plan and have, having the implications, they can go, well, this is my reasons for it. It's not a selfish reason. It's this is the best scenario these are the options that I've considered but this is the way I'm going and these are my reasons for it but it gives them a tool to explain that situation and articulate their best interest yeah yeah so in this particular case we provided a short list of 10 other facilities one of the reasons I did this was um, from what they were saying and my knowledge of the aged care facility I wasn't convinced that it was an aged care facility. I thought it was a retirement village. So I wanted to give them some other options to consider. We also provided information on how to access additional care in the home because the mother really wanted to stay in the home. Um, and quite often people want to stay in the home, but once risk behaviours start to be, to be common, like shutting out carers, refusing to take medication, wandering, that you don't want somebody to be unsafe. So sometimes staying in the home just become, doesn't become um, an option. So we also provided information about the difference between a retirement village and retirement villages are great for lifestyle um, mm -hmm. situ living. Um, if you've got 10 to 15 years and you wanna be part of a community and you want to transition from the large family home into a smaller residence, um, the retirement village has lots of positives. You just need to understand what you're signing up for, what the associated costs are. And then an approved aged care facility is a facility that is um, supported by um, the government, the Commonwealth government, and has guarantees around your accommodation payments. 
So if the aged care facility is approved and it goes into insolvency or bankruptcy and you've paid 450,000 as an accommodation, the, um, there's a government guarantee that you will get that money back. That money is also another um, thing that we often have to discuss with people is because in 2014, the rules changed um, and people know the old bond system and that wasn't a guarantee and you didn't get that money back. Now your accommodation, um, um, your RAD it's called, your re refundable accommodation deposit is actually returned to the estate as cash um, and less any fees that you've agreed to have deducted from it. Um, I think that's an important point that you just raised there, Kerry, is that the um, residential accommodation deposit comes back into the estate. So the estate implications of that can be wide and varied. Very yeah, right. So in that, well, like we've had a situation where we had one child was left the family home, two children were left the investments. If we had liquidated those particular investments, then we're actually writing someone out of the will. And it, come, it comes back in the form of yeah. cash, which then might yeah. be um, yeah. a different distribution. And often we're dealing with people who have lost capacity, so we can't adjust wills. So we have to be very mindful of what the intentions are and that we don't unravel those intentions. Around by Prescribed. Yeah, prescribed it. So you don't want to liquidate necessarily an asset that means that you've totally changed the um, estate intentions. So. In back to this particular case, the care option that they had originally been considered was not an approved aged care facility. It was actually a retirement village. And a retirement village, you can access care, but it's not supported by the government. So you have to pay that yourself. You can access your home care packages within a retirement village. But in this particular case, the deferred management fee would have been 125000 so they thought that they were looking at an aged care facility that they would have got the 500,000 back from, but this wasn't actually an aged care facility. Um, the short term solution is was to increase the care in the home. The long term solution was for the mother to go into an approved aged care facility. So um, one of the advantages of the um, aged care facility is it's 24 seven care. So going into residential care, it's not an age-based decision, it's often a health-based decision and accessing care becomes the main priority. Um, just on that there, while I've got you, you provided a short list of 10 facilities. Um, how, does, how, does that, how does that formulate it and how do you go about that? Okay, so... Um, because I can imagine myself, if I had to go through this process, I actually wouldn't know where to yeah. start, in like, a, like most. So what I, what in this particular case, like, so sometimes it's a geographic decision. So sometimes um, it will be that the primary informal carer is living on the north side or the south side, somewhere in Brisbane, and the mother and father live somewhere else. So if you're looking at aged care facilities around where they live, it means that the informal carer is going to do extensive man travel. So we talk about what, what geographic location is most appropriate. Sometimes there's additional needs. We don't get into specific clinical needs, but if it's palliative care that's required, then we can actually shortlist 10 facilities within 10 kilometer radius of a particular postcode and give you the name, the contact details and the address of those facilities. And you, um, that list um, is whether we, we try to use only places that have a, a room available. Sometimes you can put your name down, but um, that particular that particular list, one of the criteria we put in was that there had to be a room available within the next three months. Excellent. So let's move on to the next case study. I'm just, we got 10 minutes to go, so I'm sorry if I'm rushing, but I'm just, so case study two, um, a wife, that came, a lady came in to see us, she was a wife that thought she had to sell her home and move in with her daughter because she couldn't look after her husband anymore. So she'd been caring for her husband for about four or five years um, and his care needs were getting higher and she was, her health was deteriorating as well. So he actually went into hospital um, and the doctors were saying that it wasn't a good idea for him to return home. The hospital was applying pressure to move the husband because the hospital needed the bed um, and needed the husband to be 
moving into somewhere where he could access care. Um, the aged care, they found an aged care facility and the aged care facility was applying pressure to them to sign the residential agreement and they were um, quoting a full route of, in this case it was 450,000. Now, the son and daughter brought their mum in to meet, to meet with me. There was a lot of tension in that meeting. There was a lot of, um, the kids were actually, I, I think the kids' biggest concern was that the mother was just going to take the father out of the hospital um, and take him home and they were worried that her health would decline and that he wouldn't get the care he needed. The daughter was, the mother was, um, felt the only way she could afford care for her husband was to sell the house and move in with the daughter. And so there was a lot of tension amongst the three people that were in the room. They'd all been trying to talk and misunderstanding each other, I think. So the mother told me what the situation was um, and we provided an explanation about the system. And based on that, discuss that initial discussion with her, um, it was sort of fairly evident that they could have been classified as low means. So as a low means person, they shouldn't necessarily have been asked to pay the 450,000. So what we did was we modeled some scenarios. We presented a plan. There was actually quite a few conversations um, before we presented that plan with, um, the, with the kids and with the mother. And that's when it sort of became very evident. The kids' biggest concern was the health of both the mother and the father. Um, the mother was feeling like she was being pushed into things that she didn't want to. So um, we did up the plan and initially I'd done a plan that was just, we would put things in place and in 12 months time, we would have needed to review it. That actually meant that we had to, by keeping the house, we had to liquidate um, a lot more of their savings and um, the mother wasn't comfortable with that. So we changed it to a six monthly approach um, and then we were going to review it in the six months time. Uh, we also helped them with dealing with the aged care facility. So the aged care facility was saying you need to um, sign this document. They actually have 28 days to tell the aged care facility how they're going to fund their um, accommodation costs. So they didn't actually need to be um, pressure, have that pressure. So that's, that's one of the things that we sort of do is we cut through the noise of what's going on and help you understand what decisions have to be made right now, what can be deferred and sort of help you understand what's important and what's not important. So the outcome in this particular case, the father went into an aged care facility and he got the care he required. The original residential agreement was 450,000 for the place. Um, with the with the assessment of low means, that cost came down to 123,000 and we saved the client $970 a fortnight. The mother could remain in the home, um, which I think was a relief both to the mother and the daughter. The daughter didn't really want her mum to move in, but when they came in, she thought that was, that was the option to pay for the cost of care. Um, we structured a budget to ensure that not only the care needs were being um, were able to be funded, but we talked about what home maintenance was likely to um, be incurred over the next couple of years. We talked about what the insurance costs were and what her everyday living expenses were. Um, and that was, yeah, so we had that sort of discussion with the mother about what, and she didn't really in that meeting want to discuss what she spent money on. Um, turned out she wanted $50 a week for the pokies. So yeah, we had that discussion after that meeting. So we dramatic, dr dramatically reduced the stress levels in that family. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of um, people trying to do the right thing and things being misunderstood. So the family, by having a plan, the family could get back to spending time with the father and less time discussing and navigating the aged care system. Okay, so we've got five minutes to go and I've got one more case study that I want to run through with you. Question. A gentleman needed to go into care. His wife had been caring for him, but his dementia deteriorated and he required permanent care. His enduring power of attorney was his estranged daughter. She hadn't spoken to her dad for quite a few years and she didn't live in Brisbane. Um, the wife 
was a, it was um, this gentleman's second wife and she had been in Australia for less than 10 years and she wasn't um, an Australian. So, and all the assets and utilities like the car insurance, the ownership of the cars, the telephone, everything was in the husband's name. So the daughter who was in during power of attorney lived interstate. She didn't really want to deal with what was going on. Um, we did actually um, send her off to get a legal opinion about what it meant to be an enduring power of attorney. Um, and she just wanted to sell the house, pay for the care and not have to deal with anything else. So we talked her through the implications of that situation and what her responsibilities were as an enduring power of attorney. Um, the wife would no longer receive a carer's pension. So in this particular case, she'd been in, she was, um, because she was, had been in Australia for less than 10 years, she didn't qualify for an age pension, even though she was of age pension age, but she did qualify for a carer's pension um, while she was looking after her husband. And that's what she used as her pin money is what my grandmother would have called it, but her what she used for her spending. Um, so she, if, if, that we'd gone through with what the daughter wanted to do and sell the house, she would have had nowhere to live. She wouldn't have qualified for a pension. Um, and the, the father was unaware really of what was going on. He had dementia and he didn't, he wasn't really able to communicate his, his needs. And this is one of the things about have the conversations early and let your enduring powers of attorney know what your wishes are. The wife had no form of income. So in this, the outcome of this was the husband father went into care that was close to where the wife lived, where the home was. And there was a friend that was regularly visiting the, um, this particular man who also had um, some other friends who were in an aged care facility. And so we were able to um, coordinate um, the care facility. The, we, that was the first option we looked into and it turned out to be the, a good mm -hmm. option. So we utilised some of the shares and a portion of his super to pay for his accommodation costs. We established an account that would pay for the general house maintenance, home insurance, car insurance, and pay for a lifestyle cash flow for the wife. The superannuation pension was directed to an account that the aged care facility directly debited ongoing fees and the wife was able to maintain living in the home. So I'm gonna pass back over to Mark. Excellent. Thanks, Gary, for uh, <laughs> going through that quickly. Um, I'll just go back once one part is that we did receive a question oh. uh, is the comparison of facilities only in southeast Queensland or statewide no so we actually we do a lot of work um, for Victoria um, but we also um, we've done Adelaide New South Wales um, aged care is a Commonwealth legislation so we can actually give advice on um, the broad, like anywhere, any facility in Australia. And the comparison of those in the report? Sorry, so comparison of the different facilities. So, yes. yeah, so we, we can do the same thing. We have access to, like if we were to do a short list, in, in Brisbane it's it. easier for us because we know some of the facilities and we've placed people there before. So we don't always know the based on a different geographic location, but we have the um, reporting capability to get that information and we find the aged care facilities and things like that. So we do that, do the upfront research and we can still provide it, doesn't matter where it is in Australia. Excellent. Long Thank answer you. to a short, yeah. <laughs> short so, so to that answer, <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, Gary. I mean, that's great. Look, I think, um, you yeah, know, just to conclude here, because we are out of time, um, yeah, I heard you say earlier that uh, pre-planning is better than crisis planning. That's certainly the case in the aged care space. I mean, it applies broadly, but we, we definitely see the evidence of that here. Um, so with that, it's important to note that um, your service is not a crisis cash flow decision, um, you know, which is often the perception and yeah. often what people go is how do we fund it, but that's not just the only issue. So it's more about... Um, that you provide not only the care needs, the cash flow considerations, but importantly, the estate implications and be able to strategize and build build a plan around that for clients. Yeah. Excellent. Um, just finally, look at Vincent's, we're a full service, full service uh, 
uh, financial services firm um, with a broad offering, as you can see on your screen. If we can be of any assistance in any of those services or you'd like to find out more information about those services, please reach out. Um, we'd love to chat. Let's see. Um, thank you for participating today. And um, yeah. there is just one other question. <laughs> we will be putting up a PDF of the slides from today. So you will have access to that. Um, I think there's an email that goes out about that. Lovely. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Kerry, and thank you for those watching today. Thank you. See ya.